pretend we're too cute. Come on, don't look at me for a moment. If you came here for a personality, you'll be let down. But if you came here for the power of the presence of God, is there anybody desperate tonight in this place? Before you have a seat, I need you to know with great expectation and intentionality, I need you to prepare your heart. I love what we say about Impact Rally. It's never an ordinary Thursday. But when I tell you I'm backstage losing my mind because I'm watching how God's Holy Spirit has been orchestrating for weeks this service. Every element, every moment. You go, James, that's cute. No, 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 you missed it. Because if he did all of that and you showed up, there's something that his spirit wants to speak to you. There's something in your life tonight that he wants to transform, to reveal, maybe to redeem. The second half of scripture before you're seated. One of my favorite verses in scripture, which is always kind of weird to say because... They're all good. It's the Bible. I love it all. It's just one of the highlights in the version app. Ephesians 2.10. For we, would you say we? We. For we are God's masterpiece. I love it. Somebody said workmanship. That's one other translation. But I like masterpiece. Because it greater reveals the intentionality that Paul writes with. He, he's saying, no, no, no. You're not just a byproduct of this cosmic God. You're not just some collision course of galaxies and and genes and cells and no, 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 no. You're a masterpiece. For some of you tonight, that offends you. No, no, I'm not a masterpiece, James. I got so much going on inside of me, around me, against me, for we are God's masterpiece create a new in Christ Jesus to do the good things that he planned for us long ago what do you do though when you feel like I'm his masterpiece but I'm going through hell okay James you're saying I'm blessed but I really feel broken James, I I know he's a divine God and you're saying I'm a divine masterpiece because of his divine creation, but I feel more like a disaster. See, in our culture, we're so used to discarding and throwing away broken things. Oh, I don't know about you, I'll be honest. I love my new phone till it gets its first drop. It gets its first drop, the first ding, the first chip in the screen, I'm done with it. It's over. I don't want it anymore. I want a, we don't even want to repair stuff anymore. It's too much work. I don't want to repair it. I just want to discard this one and get another one. And I believe that the enemy has used how we use things to make us think that's how God sees and uses us. Well, James, I'm broken. I'm dinged up. I'm scuffed up like a pair of Air Force Ones. Some of y'all need to retire some of those, though. That's from the Lord. She goes, James, I got all this. And everybody around me discards broken people to me. And if they say it about everybody else, they, they got to say it about me. And I've watched parents discard other people. And I've watched professors discard other people. Bosses talk about other people. James, if, if you really knew the real me, you wouldn't call me a masterpiece. You'd say, I'm too broken. How broken is too broken to be chosen and used by God? This verse, 2 Kings chapter 5, and verse 1. I know your legs are tired, but some of y'all go to the club for seven hours, so you can stand. It says, now Naaman, catch this, is a resume. It's a resume. Some of y'all, you you just got done being accepted to college and putting in reference letters and having people type up stuff about you and you're applying for jobs and, you know, you're making yourself look good. 
Now Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a... Okay, sorry. Now, if we're going to have church tonight, we're going to need to figure this out. This is... When I stop talking, you start. He was a what man? Great. He was a great man. In the sight of his master, he was highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier. Listen, all of this is pretext to where we're going, but this is telling you, this is not an ordinary person. You look at this and go, man, how could I ever measure up to that kind of masterpiece? But we reconcile the relevancy of this passage in these next four words. But he had leprosy, but he was broken, but he had a disease. He was strong, but he was still suffering. The title of tonight's message is simply this, trophies and trauma. Trophies and and trauma. You're in a room tonight and you go, James, I'm winning. Everybody thinks I'm a winner, but I'm still wounded. I'm holding on to trophies on the outside, but I'm wrestling with trauma on the inside. You showed up in the right place on the right night for God to speak to your spirit. Because even the trauma couldn't stop the plans that he has for me. I'm going to ask you with hands lifted, eyes closed. Hands are lifted. It's simply an act of surrender. I'm asking you, before we get to the end, to determine right now, how will I respond? Because you make a decision, and then that decision forms the rest of your life. You are in a critical moment, in a critical season of your life. Hands are lifted. Eyes are closed. And we're going to sing this just for a moment. To remind ourselves that trauma doesn't stop the plans that he has for us. Trauma couldn't stop the plans you have for me. Even the trauma couldn't stop the plans you have for me. You ain't got to sing it. We're going to sing it over you for just a moment. couldn't stop the plans you have for me. Yeah. Even the trauma couldn't stop the plans you Come on, two more times. Even the trauma could stop the plans you have. Even the trauma could stop the plans you have. God, I know that you're here because you never, you never lie to us. You always keep your promises. You always keep your word. When we're not faithful, you still are. You don't treat us like everybody else treats us. You don't see us like everybody else sees us tonight. My friends are wrestling with the concept of how you could be a faithful father because they've never seen one. How you could be a loving father when they've only experienced pain and abuse. My prayers in these next few moments, God, that they would open their hearts just a little bit to trust you to trust you enough to know that you have a good plan for their life. That the brokenness that they're currently experiencing does not dictate the blessing that you have for their life. The circumstances and surroundings are not stronger than your might or your power. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do in these next few moments what only you can. God, help us tonight to take off the mask and get real. I thank you for it. In the name above every name, the name of the only hope I've ever had, of the King who reigns supreme. In that name, in Jesus' name, we say amen and amen. Would you fist bump somebody and have a seat? I have never been more clear about the assignment, the direction, or the place in which we'll land tonight. I need you to know that what I believe that God has been orchestrating for weeks in my mindset, but for eternity in his, is a moment for you tonight. Listen, I'm not elaborating through hyperbole. I'm trying to get us to recognize what God wants to do tonight. 
I also need to be honest enough with you to tell you this. The only limiting factor to the power of God in your life tonight will be you. It's not the person you came here with. It's not the person that has wronged you or hurt you. It's not your past. It's simply my present mindset. Am I available enough to hear what it is that God has to say to me? Now, I, I, I know some of us in this room, when we talk about brokenness and wounds, listen, I, I want to tread lightly in the beginning so that we can really understand what I'm talking about. Because I think too many times we start coupling sin, struggle, shame, guilt, and brokenness all together. And the people who have suffered because of someone else's sin now feel the shame that they did not create. So there's some of us in the room that you're a leader, but you got a limp tonight. Like James, I, I just limp my way into rally. I, I, I got the face on. Man, it's good to see you around. Look good to see you too, bro. Hey, you look good. Kicks look good, sir. Looks good. Good to see you. Hey, sis, how you doing? We smiling, high-fiving. And on the inside, we're dying. It's interesting that many of us are in this stage of life where we're learning and understanding more things about science and biology and anatomy. And we learn so much about the things that you cannot see on the surface but yet refuse spiritually or theologically to address things beyond the surface. What if tonight the work of the Holy Spirit is not so I can feel good, but so that I can live whole? See, the process by which you take broken things and put them back together is no easy process. It's, it's not simple. If you've ever really broken something, you recognize that the pieces don't always go back the way you planned. It takes a moment. It, it's a puzzle that was not created with a picture. And you're going, how do I put the pieces back together? And some of you tonight have been trying for years to put the pieces back together. I wonder if in this moment you would just say, okay, God, I've tried. I've tried everything I know to do, but I'll put the pieces out of my hand and into yours. The best person to put a masterpiece back together is the one who created it to begin with. Now, it's easy to preach to you about you. But I've been in church too long. And for some of you, you don't know my story. I, I love that, that this really is family for me here at Impact. Listen, Impact, what, what God is doing in this church, in you and through you, is rippling around the world. Amen. Pastor Darrison and Pastor Witt have become more than just church friends. They're family. Yeah. PT and Pastor Natalie have become people in our lives who champion us and love us. And I, I think it would only be appropriate in this moment to give honor where honors due to honor the gifts to this house. <laughs> Pastor Travis, Pastor Natalie, Pastor Darrison, Pastor Whitney. Like, we're so thankful for you guys. One of the reasons I love to do that is how much they hate it. Um, <laughs> but for real, I love you guys. I I'm thankful to be in a place where I can keep it a buck with you guys tonight. Because here's the deal. It would be easy to tell you, you're going through brokenness. Isn't that easy? Isn't it easy to tell somebody else that they're drama? You know what I'm saying? Like, you're just too much. You're just over here kikiing about them. Like, oh, I can't believe they said this, 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 this. It's a lot harder to look in the mirror. Listen. Let me tell you, tonight you didn't show up and there's some prolific, perfect preacher up here We're talking about somebody who's winning, still wounded. I got trophies. Oh, listen, I got trophies. I, I, I got things that are God's blessings in my life. My, my greatest blessing that God's ever given me is the love of my life for 16 years, my wife for over 14 years, and she's here tonight. She's my ride or die. She's my bride. I love you. She's my boo. We're going on a date on Saturday. She don't even know. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking about it. Back to the moment. I'm a father of two amazing boys. 
Braxton and Grayson, 10 and 8. They're staying up too late watching right now. Go to bed and do your homework. I love you. Look, you're also looking at a guy who I got to have nicer shoes all the time because I still feel like a trailer trash three-year-old who was too poor, who was concerned about how somebody would think about him. I still spend too much time thinking about outfits. I'm just keeping it a buck. Because I still wrestle with feeling like people are going to think I'm not good enough. You're like, oh, you're a preacher. You should have that thing together. I'm telling you, it's possible to be strong and still suffering. Oh, I joke a lot about being holy in hood. But if I'm keeping it real, I still wrestle with anger. I still wrestle with when injustice happens with my kids. I don't want to act righteously. I get more ratchet than righteous. I'm still struggling. If you showed up for a perfect preacher, come back when one PT or, or Pastor Darrison are preaching. Come, come back for them. Showed up tonight and it's just a broken dude trying to tell some broken people that God still heals. Oh, I, I know, I know, I know. You're like, wait, but you say you're still broken. I am. I'm still in process. Because some things are in the process of time. Some healings take a little bit longer. Oh, I would love it if I never got angry again. I never lost my cool on the road again. I would love it if somebody was late and I didn't get mad. I would love it if I didn't walk into certain places in the mall and still feel out of place because of how I grew up. I would love it if I didn't still sit down at a restaurant and think people were looking at me and seeing me as a three-year-old living in a trailer. Yo, James, you got to let that go. Well, I wonder what it is that you're not letting go of in your life tonight. See, I think the relevancy of what we find in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible in this incredible chapter, 2 Kings chapter 5, is, is a man named Naaman who has the right resume, who's been wearing his armor. Listen, you can't be a valiant soldier and not have great armor. Think about it. Every battle he's won, there's something across the breastplate that says he went to war. There's something about his sword. I bet it was bloodstained from all of the enemies that he had slayed, and yet this man, when he pulled off the armor, someone saw disease. Someone saw brokenness. We fight day in and day out an enemy that wants to still kill and destroy us. But many of us wear our armor out there and in here, and nobody ever gets to see the brokenness or do something about it. What if the hidden thing tonight becomes a revealed thing tonight so that God may heal our hearts? What is it for you? Is it insecurity? Is it the imposter syndrome? See, this, this disease, leprosy, Dr. Paul Brand wrote about this. When he was writing about leprosy, he gave us an understanding about this disease. See, I thought for years that this skin disease caused someone pain and would kill them. Now, many of you, you're more educated than I am, and you actually know that leprosy does not harm you or hurt you, it numbs you. And because it numbs you, you don't feel pain where you should. See, what happens to someone who struggles with leprosy, who has leprosy, is if they get leprosy on their hand, they could put their hand in a fire and never feel it. And because of that multiplied trauma, now it risks their life. What is the area that we've hidden so long it's become numb, but it's causing multiplied pain and trauma and drama in our lives. I know she rejected you, but she does not define the man of God that you were created to be. I know, I know that he broke your heart and he lied about you and he used you for your body, but listen to me, he did not make you so he cannot break you. God designed you, and because he designed you as a masterpiece, he can place you back together in all the right places. Leprosy, a numbing, a valiant soldier. He's winning, but still wounded. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 2 says this, No bounds of raiders of Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. If you got a physical body, a uh, Bible, I want you to go ahead and, and circle that. If you got notes, I want you to write that in. Captive a young girl from Israel. 
She kind of ends up in the footnotes of this story. She had served Naaman's wife. and She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. I don't get all of the context here because the writer doesn't give it to us, but you have to wonder one day if Naaman comes back from battle and takes off his armor and this young girl sees the leprosy, sees the disease. Is there somebody close enough to you to see beyond what you see? Is there anybody who's around you who can see beyond you? Or have you kept everyone at arm's length because you say, I'll never get hurt again. I'll never let anybody in again. I, I can't do it. You just can't trust people. What if the very people who God's assigned to your life to help heal some of the past pain and trauma you're keeping at a distance and they are, are divinely sent to your life to see beyond what you see? See, she saw the leprosy, but she didn't just see the brokenness. She saw hope past the pain. You need people in your life that when you are going through the dark night of the soul, they say, wait, but there's still hope on the horizon. You need somebody in your life that when you've had your worst day, they get into your life and say, new mercies every morning. You need somebody in your life that said, the weeping endure for the night. Joy comes in the morning. Oh, I need somebody in my life that reminds me that night and day are separated by 60 seconds. And it's just a moment. I need people in my life that when I want to run from God, they push me towards him. Who's the person in your life who's been seeing beyond you, but you've been confronting them and having conflict with them because they see a better future than you do? You're like, they keep calling me out. Maybe they're calling you up. Maybe it is that they're more committed to your purpose than your current personality. I don't like the fact that they keep checking me. Well, maybe they're checking you because they see how God's created you, that they realize that you won't be in college forever, that you won't date that bum forever, that you won't continue to have the same addiction your whole life. Maybe broken you is offended by whole you that they keep calling you to be. I need somebody close enough to me that I can trust them. All right, now look, here's what I love in church. Let's keep it a buck, all right? Here's what I love in church. Some of y'all, y'all love that. Y'all like, I got five people I'm gonna talk to tonight. Soon as it's over, pop, pop, pop. You can't wait. All right, let me help you real quick. I can tell you one way you can know that you are not assigned to someone's life to tell them what it is that's going on that's wrong with them. You wanna know one way? If you told anybody else first. Sorry, let, let, let me look. If she, if she went to all the other servants and let them know, she went to the one pl person close enough to Naaman who Naaman loved and trusted the most. And she said, ma'am, if my master could see the prophet, he would be healed. Who is it in your life right now that you've been talking about instead of talking to? Maybe God gave you vision to see the brokenness to do something about it, not to tell everybody else around them. Listen, God does not put you in anybody's life to tell other people about their sin. Can't find it anywhere in scripture. The first thing you do, Matthew 18, is you go to them. Then if they don't repent, then, then you get a couple of people, you go talk to them, all right? <laughs> Another way that you can know is this. If I'm close enough to have contact, I'm trusted enough to have conflict. Why? There's power in proximity. I gotta be close enough to your life. Listen, if I just breeze past you in the lobby at Impact Church, I don't know enough about you to correct you. You go, James, well, I got a word from God. Submit it to somebody who's close enough, who they trust and love. And you should start with Pastor Derrickson or Pastor Whitney. Amen. We'll move on. <laughs> well, actually, let me give you one more practical thing. At this stage of life, especially if you're a college student or young professional, there's something that I had someone speak to me years ago my wife and I have been doing this now for about 15 years. We create a life board, we have a board for our life. Sometimes I, I tell people, yeah, I've been talking to my board, and they're like, of what company? I'm like, James Powell, Inc. Uh, <laughs> because someone years ago was coaching me and mentoring me and said, James, 
So many people, when it comes to money and business, they treat it with higher value than they do their own life. The greatest asset that God has entrusted for me to steward is me as his creation and my calling as his purpose. So here's what we created. We, we got CEOs. You're like, are you the CEO? No, no, no. That's the chief encouragement officer. I got somebody that every time I call them, when the phone rings, they know I'm not looking for correction from them. I'm looking for, man, how you doing? I need encouragement. I got a chief integrity officer, someone close enough to my life to call things out that other people wouldn't see. You need to get a board for your life. You go, Jay's, I, I don't know what board seats I need. Start with a couple. What happens is if you'll start with this stage of life, go, maybe it's just purpose, integrity, and encouragement. As life grows, your board grows. Now I have a chief legacy officer. My chief legacy officer is teaching me how to spend intentional time with my kids, preparing me so that when my son, oldest son turns 12, I can take him through a passage of manhood. That chief legacy officer is my father. Why? Because I saw him live in such a way that I said, I want to pass on what's been passed down to me. I found people in my life that were living in an area. Some of us are going, I need a mentor. You need a mentor in multiple areas. But if you're looking for one perfect person in your life who will tell you everything that God has for you, good luck. 38 years on this planet, I've never found one person that can do all that. Why? Because they can't speak for God. But if I can entrust one area of their life where they've ran their race well, I can trust their voice into my life as well. Second Kings chapter four and verse four through six says this. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel has said. By all means go, the king of Aaron replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. When you follow the right voices, God will send victory ahead of you. These are warring kings. They're not on the same side. And yet this king says, I'll advocate for you. Why? Because I believe what you believe. There are some people in your life that are waiting to open doors for you, but it takes submission to correction for me to move forward. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. I always get held up on the 10 sets of clothing. He was going on a trip. It was some good stuff. This is a letter he took to the king of Israel. With this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, and with this letter, I'm sending my servant. With this letter, I'm sending my servant. You need somebody who's gonna go ahead of you and say, hey, I, I want you to have this. What's interesting is the king gets it twisted though. He only knows the power structure that he's in. See, the little girl said, not that there's a king in Israel that can cure you. There's a Prophet, oh, you got to go to the right place for the right resource. I cannot go to the wrong place. Some of us, if we're not careful, we are toying with things. If I could just camp here for a moment, you're toying with tarot cards, trying to figure out your future. You're, you're, you're toying with psychics right now, trying to figure out where you want to go. If I'm out of line, correct me. But that is a demonic use of the spiritual realm. I'm sure they can tell you about your past, but there's only one spirit that can tell you about your future. You need to stop going to the wrong places just because they tell you when you were born and where you grew up. A demon can tell you where you've been, but only a voice from God can speak to where you're headed. Am I out of line? If I'm out of line, PT will shut me down. I would tell you this, what I find in this passage is that Naaman had the courage to head in a different direction. If I could break it down this way, you're not stuck if you don't stay. You ever told somebody, I'm stuck in this relationship? I'm stuck in this job, one of the things that just absolutely blows my mind is when people wanna tell you the same problem five times. Five times, the same thing over and over. If it's that bad, pack a bag. It's time to go, now nah, I'm not giving you an excuse. If you're in a committed relationship, if you are married, stay in that marriage. If there's abuse involved, you need to go to a pastor. You need to have an advocate. You need to get resources. We need to help you. And if that's the case, you will get pastoral advice on what your next steps are. If you're not married, 
I don't know why you're still there. Oh, I'm just going to believe in him until he becomes a man. I got to you. No, 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 no. You don't date for potential. Listen, I married a woman. I married a woman who could see beyond me, but she knew she was going to have to deal with the real me. When we got married, I was addicted to prescription drugs. I was a pastor. Didn't even know I was addicted. I had been on prescription drugs for years. My wife came to me one night, a year and a half into our marriage. I'm pastoring in a church. She said, you're a zombie. These things have got a hold of your life. I said, no, they don't. I flushed them down the toilet. And I went on a ride because I was addicted. I needed somebody who would marry the real me but believe the best in me till I became that. You don't, you don't marry for potential. You marry the real person. But then you fight till they become who God created them to be. Listen, you better be careful what fight you sign up for. Woo! You're not stuck if you don't stay. Some of you still wrestling in the same job. Leave it. Amen. Verse 10. This is where the prophet Elisha, and I've not yet defined the word prophet, and I apologize for that. Listen, we have people every single week that show up to rally and kicking the tires of faith. And if you're new to church, please don't get it twisted. My passion is not because I'm angry. You'd have to know the entirety and the complexity of my story, that God took a broken, abused, I was... 10 to 12, I was abused in every way you can imagine. Sexually, physically, emotionally, verbally. Oh, the the passion you feel is not anger. It's gratitude that God would see fit to love me when everybody else said I was unlovable, that he would choose to love me in the midst of brokenness and sin and shame and guilt. So if you're here tonight, it's not a preacher voice. It's not a preacher thing. You ask anybody that knows me. This is how I live because I recognize what God has done in my life. James, what all has he done? Number one, and the only thing that ever matters, he sent his only son, Jesus, to live the life I never would, to die a death I deserve because of my own sin. But then he was resurrected to new life. He didn't come back to life. Don't get it twisted. He didn't wake up. He rose up. He's the only one who's ever been resurrected from death to life and never died again. Maybe there's some theologians in here. You're like, what about Lazarus? He died. A second time. Done. Jesus was raised to new life and went to heaven. The term prophet simply is this. It's someone who sees out, hears the voice of God for the future, and then calls people and pulls people into their purpose. Pulls people into their purpose through correction or through direction. This prophet, Elisha, is about to do that in verse 10. This is Elisha sent a messenger to him and says this, go wash yourself seven times. How many times? Seven. Oh, y'all ready to go seven times in the Jordan River. For context, I've been to the Jordan River. It's gross. It's nasty. My wife's from South Louisiana. She's Cajun. The water in the Jordan River is as nasty as it is in the bayou. Like it's It's muddy, you sink into it, it's gross. The prophet says, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought surely he would come out stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure my leprosy. If you showed up for a magic trick, God doesn't do them. God does miracles, not magic tricks. Naaman wants a a magic trick. Some of us, that's what we want. You go to the holiest person you know, and you're like, pray for me that I'll stop looking at porn all the time. Oh, it got quiet. (laughs) We camped there. Like, oh, I just, do it, Pastor Darius so will just pray for me. Lay hands on my mind. I won't look at porn anymore. But you still got your phone all the time. You still got your laptop at 2 a.m. 
You still got your iPad with no accountability. Then he goes, I just thought he'd come out and be like, boom, boom, done. Got him. What's up? You know why he showed up with all those resources? He was ready to pay for something. What God does, you cannot buy. You can't buy a real blessing. No, 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 no. He wants to pay for it. Elisha's like, no, we, we're not in that business. No, no, no. But here's the process. The process is go into the Jordan and wash yourself seven times. No, I don't want that. We laugh at Naaman, but that's what we want. We want to have the same struggle for 10 years, come in, sing one song, try it once, go back out there, do the same sin, and wonder why we still feel the same brokenness, pain, and trauma. I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. The same thing over and over. And God's going, no, stop the same cycle of sin. I've given you a different process. See, Naaman did not understand what Elisha was directing him to do. See, Naaman, Naaman didn't understand that Elisha was hearing from the voice of God. He did not understand the power and the metaphorical value of the Jordan River. The Jordan River is the same river in the New Testament, the second half of Scripture, that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was baptized in. It was too dirty for a broken man, but it was just right for the only clean man to ever live. What if the process that the people of God, your coaches, mentors, pastors, professors, community group leaders are speaking into your life and you go, I don't like that way. But what if God's will isn't always done your way? If it would work my way, it would have worked already. I know I talked about tarot cards and psychics. Should just go ahead and talk about sage and crystals. Listen, listen, listen. I, I need to tell you this because I don't know if you're, you're being handed tools and you don't even know what you're partnering with. You're walking into places with sage and stuff. What, what is that going to do? I can call on the name of the one who created sage. I don't need to serve sage. Sage does not serve a purpose to cleanse a spirit from my house. I walk through my house and I go, God, I thank you that you are the one who dispels every spirit. I feel icky in this house right now. I thank you that demons tremble at the name of your son, Jesus Christ. So I walk through my house, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus over my sons, Jesus over my house, Jesus over my family, Jesus over my wife, Jesus over my mind when I'm battling anxiety, Jesus over depression. Why? There's only one name by which man can be saved and every demon flees. Listen, the enemy wants you to keep playing with stuff that will keep you bound. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You don't need a crystal to align your aura. You need the Holy Spirit to fill your life. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I want to be so full of the Holy Spirit that when I get angry, when I feel out of place, that the Holy Spirit rises up in me and reminds my mind, which is conflicted, greater am I in you than everything around you, greater than the enemy in front of you. You need to get the Word of God in your life. This book is not a history book. It's not a textbook. This is the ever-living, ever-breathing truth of the Word of God. I stand on this. It's my my foundation, it's my rock, it's my lifeline, it's my help in a time of need. My goodness, you gotta sit down because I gotta end. God's will is always on your way. I remember I was I was 20 years old. I was so conflicted, I was deconstructing my faith. I had no idea how to do it. We didn't even have that word. All I knew was, I'm out. I don't want to, I was reading and studying the world's major religions, trying to figure out, am I going to be Buddhist? Am I, am I going to be Jewish or Hindu? Or Man, I was trying everything. Uh, some of you, you've walked through or are walking through, maybe as, as an agnostic or as an atheist. That wasn't my thing. I, I knew there was something or somebody, but because of abuse, and pain inside of one church context with broken people, I was missing out on Jesus. Moved to South America, I was living in Ecuador. 
I remember one night, I was leaving my boss's house. I was walking through what they call gringo land. And I had flip-flops in a backpack, which was a sure sign that I was an American. I'm walking down the street, and it was an easy target for robbers. For time's sake, I'll shorten the story that I ran through a park to get away from him. I thought I was okay. I'm on the Pan American Highway, and these three men run up on me and put a gun in my stomach. And I could hear them begin to argue. I pretended like I didn't know Spanish, but I was interpreting what they said, saying, okay, take his stuff. And the guy with the gun said, I'm gonna shoot him. And let's roll him in the park. Tears are streaming down my face. And they're yelling at me to put my hands down. There's crowds of people around me. Nobody's helping me. All of a sudden, one of the guys who's robbing me gets in between me and the gun. Tells the guy, no, no, we got enough, and they ran away. I froze. The moment, I was so mad. I was so angry. What are you doing? I'm out here trying to figure out if I even believe in you or this, and this is what happens? This is stupid. Why am I here? I wanted to fly back to the U.S., call my dad. I was crying, so shook up. Remember my dad said something to me. It made me so mad at the time. Don't tell him. He said, son, you are safer in God's will in Ecuador than you are in my house out of God's will. He is your protector. He is your provider. It began to transform how I embraced God because I thought I always had to be in the right spot doing the right thing, and, and yet here God is while I'm deconstructing going, no, 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 you're still part of my will. I'm still covering you. I'm still protecting you. What if God's will for your life isn't just here am I, send me somewhere else. But for you, it's to be planted in this house. What if every Thursday you didn't make a decision if you're gonna show up at rally? You just go, no, this is where I've gotta be. Why? Because I know there's something about being in God's house that transformed my life. You go, James, well, why, why? Attendance doesn't matter. It's not in the Bible. Actually, it is, just so you know. It says, do not forsake the assemblings of yourselves together. It's important for us to get together. All the more as the day get darker. What if God's will is it done your way where you could just pop in and out? You could power through one verse on you version and live a spiritually anemic life. What if God's will for your life maybe is to submit yourself to leadership at this house? Say, I'm gonna serve every week. I'm not gonna show up and consume. I'm gonna show up, I'm gonna contribute. I'm gonna be a part of what God's doing here. Why? There's something about when God does something in you and does something through you that it multiplies and maximizes what he's doing around you. What does God want to do, not just for you, but through you? I've got to choose to trust God even when I don't understand. Naaman gets angry. He's upset. It says that some of the people get together. 2 Kings 5, 12 and 13. It says this. Naaman speaking, he goes, They're not the Abana and the Far Par, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. He's still upset about this one dirty water. This man who's struggling with leprosy wants to get mad about dirty water instead of address his disease. I'd rather come in church and complain about the time. I'd rather come in rally and complain about the music. I'd rather come in rally and complain about the person who upset me or hurt me or said that one thing about me instead of push in to what God is asking of me. So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said this, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? We don't, we don't like it when worship leaders now in, in this generation, we don't like it when they tell us to lift our hands. Some of you got really upset when I was like, lift your hands. You're like, I don't want to lift my hands. Why do I have to lift my hands? There's nothing magical about lifting my hands. No. Is something meaningful about obedience? Is something about directing my heart posture of submission? PT told me right now, he goes, James, sit down. Guess what I do? I turn the mic off, I'd sit down. Why? I have a heart that is positioned to submit to the authority that God's put in my life. Listen, listen, hold on. I know it's not easy to clap for because some of you have been hurt and harmed by those in authority. But just because one person in authority harmed me doesn't mean the next person in authority can't help me. Yeah. What if God has a covering for your life? 
I told to God on my own, you sure can. You have a high priest named Jesus who tore the veil for you 100%. But I need people around me who can cover me in the moments that I can't cover myself. So 2 Kings 5 and 14. So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan. How many times? Seven. Oh, come on. How many? Seven. Seven times. As the man of God had told him to do, and his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a young boy. Seven times. Is it interesting how many times it say seven? Can I give you a little bit of Hebraic context for this? Seven would have said to every Hebrew boy, completion. Remember when Naaman didn't understand why? Naaman was like, why the Jordan? He had no idea that Jesus would dip in that Jordan, that, that the Israelites had crossed the Jordan. He, he doesn't have enough context to understand the miracles that have taken place in that one place. And now his story will be shared for thousands of years, sharing in the same waters he thought were too dirty for him. But they were powerful, poignant. And seven, seven simply this, completion. Elisha says, dip seven times. How many of us have tried what God told us one time and quit? I tried to tithe and give to a church. It didn't work, I'm still broke. You tried one time. Like you tried sinning for 15 years and you didn't give up on that? <laughs> but when it comes to the work of God, I want magic, not miracle. It says Naaman dipped seven times and came up and his, his skin was made whole. <laughs> I gotta wonder, because you know how I would have liked the miracle if I'm Naaman, like you dip one time, you come up and you're like, <gasps> It's fading. We don't see it. That's what I want. I want like, God, show me what you're doing. God, show me you're working it. Show me how you piece these things together. I don't think that's the way it worked. He dipped one time and came up. Stupid water. That idiot. I knew he was just making fun of me, telling me come down here in this Jordan River. This is stupid. I gotta believe that young girl was on the bank going, just do it again. Don't give up, try it one more time. He said seven, Naaman. Fine, two. I did it, it's still not working. No, 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 but he said seven. He didn't say one, he didn't say two, he didn't say three, he didn't say four. Listen, when they walked around the walls of Jericho, it wasn't stop on six, it was complete to seven, shout on seven, dip to seven. What is it that God's asking you to do tonight? He goes, James, what are you saying? Do I gotta do one, two, three, four, five, six? No, complete surrender. How do you wash yourself? All the way under, all the way up. There's victory in the value of obedience, but partial obedience is disobedience. I cannot work the will of God halfway and expect God to do it the whole way. If I want full healing, it requires full surrender. Do you hate? being broken bad enough? I do. I do. Do you hate feeling shame bad enough? I do. You go, James, but you told us up top, you still deal with us up, but I'm still dipping, baby. Every time I can get in God's presence, and that's not just on Thursday or Saturday or Sunday, that's riding down the road going, God, today I need the power of your Holy Spirit. I need you to speak to me. I need a Father who doesn't abandon me. I need to know that you're here for me. Because so James, I'm so struggling watching porn, or I'm struggling with the addiction to alcohol, I'm, I'm struggling with the addiction to Adderall, I'm buying it off all my friends on campus right now, and I can't get enough, and you're struggling with this. Here's what I'm telling you, it's hard to sin if I stay in the presence of God. James, how do I do that? Some of you need to pop your AirPods in. I lived on the college campus for two years. Y'all leave them in all day long anyway. But what is going through them? 
I want to stay in the presence of God. Why? If I can stay there, completely surrender, he begins to reforming me, reshaping, remembering me, putting back together the broken pieces, saying, no, 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 for you are God's masterpiece. Oh, you must have forgot. You must have forgot that, that this man, Naaman, this man, Naaman, was not forgotten. Listen, he was against the people of Israel. He was against them, and yet God does something for him and through him. And now through eternity, we'll tell the story of his obedience. What is it that God wants to do in you, through you, and for you that isn't just about you, but is tied to those around you? You're like, that was Dr. Seuss. It was way too hard to understand what you just said. Let's go straight to Alabama. God loves the people around you too. And he wants to do a miracle in your life because the greatest testimony and witness that I have of the power of God is not just that I understand all the scriptures say, but I've partnered with them and the way I live is different. The way I act is different. The way I process is different. I do not allow the trauma or the trophy to dictate my life anymore. I have a father in heaven who gets to guide me and lead me because he created me. That's what I want for you tonight. And for some of you, for some of you, Tonight, you go, James, I don't feel broken. I feel whole. I feel great. God's blessed me. I'm walking liberated. Amen. You want to know your role in the story? To be like that servant girl. We don't even get her name, but she knew who to run to and where to find them. I dare you to show up at your job on your college campus and tell somebody, hey, I, I know what you've been going through. I know you're going through that breakup. You feel abandoned. You feel alone. I, I know that you just experienced death and grief and loss in your family. Listen, I know a place. They're not perfect, but they got some hope. I, I know a place. They're not just excited. They're passionate. I know a place. Oh, they, they ain't got it all together. Some days they're falling apart, but they know the one to rely on and lean on. I wonder what it would look like for us tonight to say, I'm going to make a conscious decision. I'm going to make a decision to say, God, I won't just dip once. I won't just dip twice. I won't just come to this, this altar. An altar is an expression for this, a place where I exchange what I have for what he has. It simply is, in the Old Testament, they would take a sheep, a goat, a dove, and they would go and offer that. And God would meet them there and take this thing and exchange his righteousness. Yeah, James, I didn't bring a goat. Thank God. But tonight, maybe this altar becomes a place of great exchange. Some of you, you need to lay down your trophies tonight. It's your armor. You've been hiding behind them for years. Athlete, producer, DJ, author, singer, actor, professional, money, lack of it. You got all kinds of trophies. I dare you to trade them tonight. Say, God, I don't want my trophies. I want your presence. Some of you, you got trauma and brokenness. And somehow you think God doesn't want that. Do you know what God desires? Whatever you got. Whatever you got. You come to the place of great exchange tonight and you lay down trauma and pain and abuse and brokenness, anxiety and depression. Look, you're looking at somebody who has struggled with anxiety his entire adult life until two years ago in February. In February of two years ago was the last time I had an anxiety attack. God reminded me recently, said, James, you told everybody about your story of how you have anxiety. It's time you give me glory that I'm still the God that heals. I'm still the God who can remove anxiety and depression, suicidal ideation, brokenness. Some of you tonight, it's your time to get free. I'm not gonna count to three if it's you tonight. You meet me right here and we're gonna dip tonight until we get set free. I'm asking you all over this room, pull it down, pull it up. If you're in this room right now, and you say, James, I need a touch from God. I'm ready to completely surrender. I'm not going to partial dip. I'm not going to tip my toe in it. If you say tonight, I need to meet with God and I need to exchange what I have for what he has. No eyes are closed. No heads are bowed. That's you. I'm going to ask you to move right now and meet me here. Meet me here if that's you. Amen. Come on. If that's you. I don't care if you move first or not. What's important is that you move. If that's you tonight, you go, James, what's magical about this? There's nothing magical. There's something meaningful when I move and trust God to do what only he can do. If it's 20 feet that separates me from freedom, I'll move. 
just a moment, we're gonna pray. Listen, all of you down here, please look at me. I know it's a big deal. I know it's not easy. Listen, what I would love to have done is have everybody close their eyes, bow their head, have you raise your hand and pray for you. But Naaman didn't get the opportunity to heal in private. He had to trust God to show up. What I am asking you to do tonight is not just going on my word or going on what I said, but going on what the word of God says, that when I move and trust what God is doing, that he does his part, the miraculous. You did what you can do. Now you can bank on God doing what he will do. You go, James, well, I don't know. That just, that feels like it puts God on the line. That's the best place for God to be. Listen, I'm tired of praying safe prayers. I'm tired of going, God, heal me if you want to. I know he wants to heal me because he's Jehovah Rapha. I'm tired of saying, God, I don't know if you want to remove this anxiety. He's Jehovah Shalom. He's my peace. So in just a moment, we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask God to meet you in this moment, to restore your heart to renew your mind. Some of you have been struggling with the same thing over and over. I believe that tonight it ends. What's significant about this? Well, first, let me just remind you, the, the river, water all throughout the Bible is an archetype for the Spirit of God. We're gonna worship in a moment. You know why? Because we're gonna dip in His presence and we're gonna allow what God does through His Spirit to work in our lives. You believe that? I believe it. And there's a group of you here you're not walking with Jesus yet, and I'm gonna give you anonymity and privacy to make a personal decision to follow Jesus for the first time. But James, why should I do it? There's only one man who loved you enough to die for you and to not stay dead. He's not just a good man, he was the God man. And if he took care of death, if he took care of forever, he can take care of now too. I'm asking you to surrender your life tonight. It's the best decision you'll ever make. It's not the easiest, but it's the best. Some of you tonight, you've been living one foot in and one foot out tonight, you put both foot in. And you say, tonight I'm committing to following Jesus. I'm gonna ask everyone in this room, bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. You're here, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. I will not stand you up, I will not call you out, I will not call you forward. What I will encourage you to do is, after I pray for you tonight to tell somebody, tonight I met a man, his name is Jesus. And he loved me enough to die for me and erase a new life. If that's you, you want to start a, a relationship following him. I believe it's the best decision you'll ever make. On the count of three, would you raise your hand? One, you didn't show up by accident. Two, he's had this moment marked on his calendar since the dawn of eternity. He doesn't want to judge you. He wants to love you. If that's you, on the count of three, would you raise your hand in this place? I see you. Come on. I see you. Wow, I see you. Come on. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Come on. Hands are going up all over this place. I see you. I'll wait on you. I'll wait on you. Hey, you keep going. I'm waiting. Yeah, I see you. Yes, ma'am. I see you. Yes, ma'am. I see you. Come on. He's still working on your heart. I see you. You can put your hands down. I'm going to ask you, rally, stand up with me. We're going to pray. God, I thank you that you're in this place, that you are a loving father, that you sit your one and only son, Jesus Christ, to live the life we couldn't, die the death we deserve because of our own sin and shame, but you were raised to new life to prove that nothing would ever stop your love for us, not our past and not our present. I thank you that you have a hope and a future, good plans for our lives. I pray for my friends that tonight, for the first time or first time in a long time, they would trust you with their life. And as they do that, God, that you would lead them and guide them into true freedom a life forever with you. I thank you that because of tonight, their name is written in heaven. Their eternity and future is secure. Their past is forgiven and their purpose is cemented. That They are now sons and daughters of the Most High King. Thank you for it. I ask everyone in this altar space, if you'd lift your hand. The worship team's gonna start singing. I'm gonna ask every leader at Rally, every pastor, every volunteer, I'm gonna ask you to make your way forward. Tonight, we're gonna pray with people. I believe that tonight, no one will stand alone. No one will endure this moment alone. Naaman had people around him to believe with him. We are a family. We're not a community that just shows up for a performance. We get into life together and pursue the presence of God. So I'm gonna ask you, move now. Don't wait on the one, two, three, don't wait on the go. You go find somebody, you find a brother and a sister and you start praying. God, I thank you that tonight, this is the place of freedom.
I thank you that tonight anxiety does not rule and does not reign. I thank you that addiction no longer dictates tomorrow or the next hour. I thank you for freedom from lust. I thank you for freedom from the addiction to pornography, the addiction to Adderall, the addiction to alcohol, the addiction to weed, some to addiction to heroin and meth. I thank you that tonight whom the Son, your Son, Jesus Christ, has set free, that they are free indeed. I thank you for healing from past trauma, abuse, abandonment, some who are dealing with the effects of sexual abuse. As a child, I pray tonight, you as a loving father will begin to restore hearts and minds. Some that are waking up at night with night terrors, that tonight would be the first night of peaceful sleep. I thank you that your word says, you keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you tonight. We fix our thoughts on you. We fix our mind on you. We fix our heart on you. I pray for some who are dealing with the pain of rejection from friends, pain of rejection from past relationships, going, I'll never love again. I pray that tonight they would be filled with the only love that lasts forever. I pray that tonight your love that casts out all fear would fill their hearts. I pray for tonight healing in family relationships. For some of my friends, I pray for forgiveness. If that's you tonight and you go, James, I'm just to be honest, I need to forgive somebody. That's the pain and the trauma that I'm carrying. If that's you, would you lift your hands? I pray right now, God, I pray that you would give us the power of your spirit to forgive. You know we are not humanly capable of forgiving on our own. But God, if you forgave us of our sin, because of our relationship with you, because of the power of your spirit, would you help us to forgive what we cannot forget? to forgive the pain, to forgive the trauma, to forgive the abuse. Would you help us tonight to live set free? I pray as we do that tonight, God, that you would restore joy back to our lives. Your word says that bitterness dries up the bones. I pray tonight that youth would be restored to my friends, that there would not be bitterness or offense that clogs the arteries of their heart, but instead love, peace, Joy, I pray for supernatural joy like never before would begin to spring up like a well in their hearts. I thank you that a byproduct, a fruit of your spirit is joy. Some of my friends have been walking around with depression. I pray that joy would supersede the jeopardizing effects of the depression, that they would be set free in Jesus' name.